Hey everybody and welcome back. If you're new to my channel, I'm everything large scale model airplanes, uh, electrics, uh, and if you're a longtime follower, welcome back. And this is a continuation of my C-130 project. If you don't know much about it, go back and there is an overview video. Um, you'll see in the description here and I'll discuss that in a little bit but basically I just love to build giant scale aircraft so let's get started here so <clears throat> the overview video the airframe design video and the fuse video are the links are in the description below this video is about the wing and this air this project lasted about three and a half to four years before I sold it I do not have a ginormous amount of money, but I build ginormous airplanes, and sometimes I've got to sell an airplane to pay for the hobby. I didn't, that was not the intent of this. I just had somebody offer me more money than I thought anybody would want to pay for it. So the airplane went bye bye. I did have over 4,000 pictures, though, I collected over the um, build cycle, over that three or four years. And I've had a lot of people say, would you do an in-depth video series on each part of the airplane and use those 4,000 pictures? So that's where we're at. So I'm going to quit babbling here. Before we get too far, I want to talk about an awesome company that I partner with and um, or work with, and it's called rtlfasteners.com. If you go to the website, they got all the bolts and nuts that we love for the hobby. They've got the blind nuts, the lock nuts, the metric standard uh servo screws everything we love for the hobby they have if you use the top secret code da30 and you spend more than 50 dollars, you'll get 30 percent off your order and um sorry i'm getting text and calls and everything i'm trying to do this video three times and people keep calling me to talk about airplanes so let's get going so uh and let me make this bigger so basically today we're going to talk about the wing um the wing was one of the most complicated things I've ever done. I don't want to say the most meticulous, but just to get everything to work right. Um, I normally design in CAD first, take it into 3D, make sure everything kind of works and fits. Um, and then I start to build parts. And normally I like to start with mock-ups, but if the mock-up works, then it becomes part of the flight hardware. Okay, makes sense, hopefully. So, um, normally I will print everything out from my plotter and then cut it out and use 3M77 contact uh, adhesive, lightly fog the back, and then I'll stick it to the wood and then I can cut it all out with my bandsaw. So this was a mock-up of the ribs that were going to have the flap tracks in it, but this is not what ended up going in the airplane. I did not like the way this worked because through testing, the wood tracks wore too fast. I needed to use something harder, okay? But first of all, it's a foam wing that has a lot of hard points in it, so I had to make some templates so I could use my hot wire to cut it out. I also had to cut a whole bunch of little bitty parts. Okay, I'm just sharing with you right now, there's two kind of different worlds on this wing design. The parts I had to cut out that were wood, and then the foam I had to work with. So what I did was I took my hot wire system and cut out an airfoil, okay? So if you look on the right-hand side of this picture, you will see what looks like a half of a airfoil with some aluminum tape on it. That was my template that I could run my hot wire over. I do wanna warn you though, make sure you know what type of hot wire system. If you're Frankensteining it like I did, this power supply is an AC power supply. If you touch that wire and you're grounded when you're cutting it, it could potentially kill you. So make sure that you use a DC system. I'm using an AC system because it's a Frankenstein system I designed myself and didn't pay anything. Well, paid eight bucks at a garage sale. So that's my system, but don't do what I'm doing here um, because you could shock yourself. So I cut out the wing the wings airfoil, then I removed where the flaps would be, okay? So if you look at this picture here, the left is the center where the fuselage would be, the far right is where the aileron would be, everything else in the middle there is where the flap would be. Then I laid on my wood hard points, and what I mean by a hard point is that's where you would attach a flap or attach the nacelle or anything that needs to hang off this wing or is part of this wing that needs some structural rigidity to it. So this is just laying on the foam right now. So then I would take the bottom um, part of the foam 
that the airfoil is removed from and lay my ribs in there and make sure that they kind of fit the airfoil and everything kind of lined right. Next thing I do is I cut up the entire wing where the hard points are going to be. Okay. And then you go through and make sure you mark with a marker what every part is and where it goes. You can get confused, frustrated, start making new parts and realize, oh, I already made that part. You really need to be, um, you really got to stay ahead of the curve here. Okay. Because when you end up with all these, you got a foam wing with a lot of wood parts and that becomes confusing. So here's what it looks like with the hard points sitting in the foam wing. It's not glued together yet. But as you can see, this is turning out pretty slick right here because I've got a foam wing with all of these wood hard points. Another thing you got to be really careful about, if you're going to put a wing joiner tube, and I make my own out of fiberglass, um, and I might do a video just on that because I've had people ask me how I do that. But essentially, you've got to make sure that where your hole is going to go through all your ribs makes the top of your wing at a zero dihedral. You don't want it to go through the middle of the wing, almost like an aerobatic airplane that has the leading edge at zero dihedral. On the C-130, the top skin of the wing was at zero di di dihedral. Here's another picture of them temporarily laying in there. And then what I wanted to do was experiment with my flap design because this is a mock-up of the center section. So I had cut out all the pieces I knew where all the hard points were gonna be. So I took a section of the foam I'd cut out use two hard points and just as a mock-up place some flat parts on it just to see if it would work and it did um, now I did not I did not spin the how do I say this I could have probably designed it to get the full 40 degrees of deflection but a model aircraft we don't need flaps and most people flaps make you a worse pilot because you don't know how to retrim the plane you don't understand how much drag flaps add but on the C-130, I wanted the flaps to move after the wing and then tilt down like a real C-130. But I did not intend on having 40 degrees of flaps. It was like 28 degrees, I think, when I was done. So this is the phenolic sheet that I cut out the groove in because it would not wear. My original ribs that had just wood grooves were not strong enough, first of all. The flap could move the wood around a little bit, but it also wore the wood. So this is an example of the flaps up full. And if you measured and drew a line on that table right there and call this zero, by the time it was fully deflected, it was about 28 degrees, almost 30 degrees. So this was that little. But then on the center section, I mean, this section of the flaps with the center section to the left, I started experimenting with deploying it. And then I really started going to town with getting the servos moving it. Uh, another picture of the servos all the way deployed because these servos moved 180 degrees so when the flaps were all the way deployed the servo saw no stress because it was completely in line you can see how i do that in some of my other videos here's another picture of the flaps fully deployed another picture these flaps are really cool everybody once they were done and working they were just just slicker than snot and um, had a lot of haters come out and say this wouldn't work, but it, it did. So, you know, for you makers and builders and people wanting to invent things yourself, just ignore the haters because they probably have no idea. They've never done anything we're doing, that's for sure. And this is the wing upside down where I'm starting to glue together all of the um, styrofoam airfoil sections to the hard points and making sure everything's lined up and good. Okay, now what I'm saying is I'm gluing the ends together. I don't have a skin on this yet. This is my skin. I glued it together with tight bond, but then I glue the actual balsa wood to the foam with Gorilla Glue because Gorilla Glue, if you don't read the directions on Gorilla Glue, shame on you. Gorilla Glue needs moisture to activate. Okay, so once I get my Gorilla Glue on here and I squeegee it all out, and here's me applying my Gorilla Glue before I squeegeed it all out. If you notice on the right-hand side there, there is a water bottle. If you lightly missed all of that and then put your wing together with weight, when that Gorilla Glue foams up, it will wick into the styrofoam where there's any cavities or anything, and it will soak into the wood, and you end up with one of the greatest ways to sheet foam I've ever seen in my life. 
it's so much better than the old sorghum days back in the 80s that we used to do um but i absolutely love it i absolutely love it and but you you've got to practice some if you get too much on there the foam can actually expand and make some little humps or blisters in your skin it needs to be as thin as you just squeegee it all off and as long as you can see a little bit of reflection in the wood that's enough gorilla glue so on to kind of the center section mock-ups here this was to i had hard points mounted i had the hard points that would attach it to the fuselage and then i started test it, fitting it to the fuselage and again this was just slick how perfect it worked i mean it was awesome um it was just perfect everybody i mean this was just coming together so nice now this is the wing with the top skin glued on and this was a big controversy for everybody for some reason i was not going to make any hatches to get my servos out because i didn't want to add the weight i didn't want to add the time i was already frustrated with the project and i just wanted to bury them if one went bad i was going to cut it out i've had over a hundred i think 36 or 44 servos in the last 15 years and knock on wood i've never had one fail now i've blown the gears out on one when i crashed a plane or something but i've never had a servo just quit but i only buy quality servos like high tech or whatever um and, and look, I don't know what it is. If I, if a lot of people crash an airplane and use that servo again, and chances are that servo has been hit, and then they wonder a month later, oh, my servo went bad. Well, it's because of the crash you had a month ago. Um, and I am knocking on wood right now because I have not had a servo go bad in so long. It is absolutely crazy. But I buried my servos, but I needed to have a way to get the wire and everything through the wing. So I created these cool little access panels. And again, you got to number everything, folks. <laughs> You're never going to get it to go back together. And this was with the skin on both sides of it and my access panels. And you got to admit, that is really slick where the flap goes. That looks so scale. So I started messing around with jigging everything up to make sure I could get everything as straight as I possibly could. Because right now, if the wing is still a little crooked, you can straighten it and then when you glass it it will hold that little whatever you got to do to straighten it once you glass it then it's locked in even though it's 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 gorilla glue together and everything and it's really super rigid i have found out until i put that final glass on i can still tweak a little bit if i've got to so this is where i'm just checking all of my incidences this is the flaps up uh, where the aileron is going to get cut out just to make sure everything was right now, on the leading edges of this airplane, I did not want to put a big chunk of, um, I'm sorry, on the leading edge of the aileron, I'm sorry, the leading edge of the aileron, I didn't want to put a big chunk of wood there. I wanted to make the ailerons as light as possible. The lighter the aileron is, less chance it's going to flutter, okay? So what I did was I wetted down my wood, curved it around a piece of foam, and that's what became how my aileron was made. And again, it worked perfect. I used my old soldering gun to melt out where my hard points were going to go in my ailerons for the servo controller, the hinges. This was the servo with a aluminum uh, push rod I made that was going to go back to control the aileron. That little aluminum thing right in the middle that you're looking at is where the servo was going to grab and move it. I hate having big horns hang out on my airplane. Some of them do, but this one I want it to look as real as possible. So now on the leading edge, I've had a lot of people, a lot of people ask me, why do their planes stall so abruptly? If you have a pointy leading edge, the wind, the airflow is gonna make a very quick decision if I'm gonna fly or stall. If you have a really round leading edge, it's much more predictable. So what I do is I take one of these really nifty little gauges I got at, um, I think, Home Depot or Menards or wherever, and made sure this is the airfoil I want, okay, which was very scale to the real C-130. <clears throat> and I would sand my whole wing to make sure that it conformed exactly to that, okay? Then once I had the leading edge on, I had the whole airplane basically ready to glass cloth. I went through and took a pause. And just so you know, it's at this point 
when I'm getting ready to fiberglass the wing, I'm asking myself, have I really done everything? And believe it or not, I set both wings aside for a month and worked on the fuselage and the tail and then came back to the wings and made sure that I was really ready to move forward with it and make sure the flaps were really going to do what I wanted them to do. Okay. So I then spackled the wing and then had it all basically perfect. There's two little grooves on the leading edges where long aluminum pieces slide in that hold on my nacelles. Then I started to glass it and I love glassing and I used the West system and I used uh, the 1.5 ounce cloth, which was a, a mistake. I should have used the 0.75 I have. The glass cloth was a little bit heavier than I needed. Um, this wing is so strong right now, I could have monocoated it and it would have been fine. It didn't need the glass cloth. And I wish I would have monocoated it. And if you followed some of my other videos where I love to paint monocoat, this plane would have been much lighter if I would have monocoated this wing with silver, a uh, monocoat, and then painted it the way I wanted. That way, if I ever scratch it, it looks like aluminum underneath it. <clears throat> That's a trick I've done on a couple of Corsairs and I love it. <coughs> Excuse me. So here I've glassed the top. I always glass the bottom first, then glass the top. Uh, this is it getting its very first primer around the edges and things, just making sure that I'm getting everything covered. One thing about foam, the paint gets into the foam, it's going to melt it. So make sure that you go through with a little bitty like acid brush and you take your West System epoxy and you paint it in anywhere that paint can get to because once that paint gets in there, it will melt it. Now, it's not going to melt it enough to really structurally affect the airplane at all, but you might just look in there and see that melted foam and go, oh, that looks like crap. This is what it looked like primed. And I did uh, sand this with both 400 and 600 before I hit it with my paint. Uh, I did not wet sand it because I was afraid of the water getting into any of the wood and causing it to swell a little bit. So I did dry sand this. If this was a fiberglass, uh, well, my fiberglass fuselage, I did uh, wet sand, but not the wing because of the, the wood in it. I'm just nervous. Um, this is where I started to, I think, glass my flaps. This picture might be out of order. I apologize. And this is me just test fitting the nacelle on the, the painted wing and making sure everything worked right. This was me, the center section had not been mounted right yet, so I wanted to make sure before I glassed it, I got my outboard wing completely done, or at least glassed, and then I made sure that I sanded to make sure that once I glassed that center section, it fit perfect, okay? These are the flaps that I cut out of foam. This is basically a balsa wood skin bottom half of the flap. The trailing edge was balsa, because you know it fits in and kind of locks into the wing. And then the foam went in between the hard points. And the reason I did it this way is I did not want to put a bunch of ribs in there and add weight. I actually didn't even um, skin the top of that white styrofoam there. I, I put my three quarter ounce glass cloth over it. I did spackle it and sand it, but I did not want to add any more weight to those flaps. Okay. So in the end, this is what the entire wing looked like when it was ready for paint. This is another angle of it ready for paint. This is the nacelles mounted once I decided to make it a J model. And I'm going to do a whole video on these. And this is where the most haters came out. Um, but maybe by luck I was right, or maybe because of experience of doing this since 1978. Um, that's when I started model aviation as a kid with Gillow's kits. But this... Um, is just perfect everybody this is just sexy as can be absolutely awesome another picture of the wing within the cells and i'm going to do a whole video on the cells then this was it painted with the flaps deployed and it was just absolutely slicker than snot everybody i mean this was one of the coolest projects i ever did it was super hard to sell but i had a lot of other dreams i wanted to do in the hobby and i was out of money again so the next video is going to be on the tail, how I designed, uh, not, I'm sorry, how I built the tail, cut out the foam, all that, not the design of the tail. The tail's really simple design. I used CompuFoil, and that's pretty much all I did. So 
That's it, everybody. I hope you enjoy the C-130 build series. Um, the next video is the tail. Then we're going to do the nacelle. Then the landing gear. Then the ramp in the back. The radio setup. The props, both the four-blade version and the six-blade version. And then we're going to have a miscellaneous video at the end to kind of capture anything I forgot or a request I get from you. I get most of my requests from my Facebook because I get a lot of PMs and just a lot of people posting when I post the video. I do get some from YouTube, but not nearly as many as I do my Facebook. So um, that's it, everybody. I hope you enjoy this. It did go actually faster than I thought. I thought it would be a 30-minute video, and I see we're about 20-something. So look, everybody, you know I end these videos always by begging you to take a kid flying. Okay, we've got a problem with model aviation right now. And we are running off the youth by saying their drones suck or the FPV suck or, you know, I'm so sick. I'm 59, but probably mentally I'm a 12-year-old. But the thing is, I'm sick of these old timers. Um, you know, I'm pretty, look, I'm pretty tough. I've done this long enough that people and, and you know, the naysayers and the trolls will post stuff. I just erase it. I don't even reply to it. I won't even argue with them. But if it's a 12 or a 14 year old kid, boy or girl and they're new to the hobby and somebody goes, oh, there's no need for anything bigger than a four channel radio. Any model airplane should be able to fly on a four channel radio has never built any of the aircraft that we're flying today. OK, now, look, if you're back with Orville and Wilbur and you had them fix your bicycle and you decided to get into model aviation, who knows? But I've had people lately seeing things that are so ridiculously dumb uh, and I don't like to judge people and I don't like to put people down but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defend kids and I've got a lot of them on my Facebook reach out to me and say hey thanks for kind of being a warrior about this because I hate this club because they treated me like crap we have a huge oh I don't want to use the word <laughs> I don't want to use the word pandemic or uh, <laughs> there is a huge problem right now with our model aviation community running the youth off and if you're an old fart go ruin somebody's golf game go ruin somebody's uh, uh, tennis game but don't run off the youth because quite frankly they're a lot more important than you sitting in your lawn chair next to a 75 pound 60 inch p40 that won't fly okay and i know i'm being judgmental when i say this but i have a huge passion for keeping the youth in this hobby and um, I see some of them build the most fantastic foam planes and people call it garbage. You know, I had somebody the other day on, on a lot of my stuff gets shared on the internet. Somebody shared one of my builds and somebody actually said, why would this person spend so much time detailing an airplane that's not scale or it's not of a full scale airplane? And I guess that person needs to go ask Picasso and Rembrandt and all the things they did when they were using their, their juices to do something really neat, why they weren't painting a picture of a freaking rock or why, weren't, why were they being so detailed when they could have you know, drew a picture of a dead tree. So, you know, there's so much hate going after people when you do really cool things. And... Um, yeah, that's it, everybody. Sorry for the little editorial there at the end, but I just, I'm so passionate about kids being in model aviation, okay? So rock on. Have an awesome day. I'll see you next time. I do have my ultralight update coming up on my air bike, and I do have the continuation of the MSL1 video series. I got bogged down by that, and I got some really super, super exciting news that the Fra Emestein, the transport plane, is being brought back into my shop in July to be ready for Ceph next year. I'm going to do a whole video on that, hopefully in the next week. But if you haven't been following me, the Frymestein is the most Frankenstein transport plane, 220-inch wing, going to be able to carry 35 pounds of cargo to drop out the back with parachutes, eight-foot-long cargo bay. It is insane. And I got the plane about 80% done, hated the wings, and decided to put it in storage. In July, it will be back in my shop, and I'm going to have it done by Seth next year. Rock on, everybody. Have a great day, and see you next time. Bye.